Hi everybody, today we're talking to Tim Estadol. Tim is a journalist and podcast host. Tim runs a podcast called Pick Up a Truck and he has more than 19,000 subscribers. Let's jump into it. With 30 years experience in auto logistics and state-of-the-art locations in five major Australian cities, Precar Fleet Services are a premier all-in-one solutions provider for commercial vehicle fleet operators, leasing companies and original equipment manufacturers. Please visit precar.com.au. So thanks very much for joining us today, Tim. Great to have you on the show. It's a real honor for us to speak to someone like yourself. Can you maybe just kick things off? Tell us about your podcast and your background. You're a journalist. What are the type of things you do? Thanks for having me, first of all, and I'm happy to be here. I've been I'm a journalist now for, oh, going on 12 years. And about uh, about six, seven years ago, I created a pickup truck plus SUV talk as really an outlet that really focuses on, well, (laughs) guess what? Trucks and SUVs. I mean, that's, that's the heart of the market here in America. And so I really wanted cover it in more detail. And I tend to have a unique viewpoint on it. I was born in a GM family, lived different areas where different plants were, and I've always been around trucks my entire life. And so once I got into becoming a journalist, it was a natural fit for me to take my life experiences and apply them to automotive. And then also being that I was 26 or so when I went to college, so a little bit different aspect on life versus my friends in college. I have a lot of business background, so it's kind of nice. I can use some of my business background, plus some of my you know, natural understanding of trucks and SUVs to kind of combine it into a, we do a podcast, we do live streams, we have a YouTube channel, we have a website, and we do well all, all, all your social media these days, all the tiki talkies and Facebooks and things we have to do these days to make a living. But we do all that stuff. And so, um, you know, just really hyper focused on the truck and SUV market, uh, usually in the United States. Although I will say I have, I have a growing audience in Australia, I have a growing audience like in uh, France and Germany, also in some more Nordic countries, because as people want to explore more and get outside more, a truck or SUV is kind of a natural fit. And and they tend to like the bigger sizes like we do in America, where you have you just have more room inside the vehicle, more stuff you can carry. You can be out for longer trip, longer distances. So I'm finding that happens in my audience a lot where I can't say they're cross shopping, although I've had some people reach out that have a little coin in their pocket and they are importing in full size trucks and they don't really care about the price. They just that's what they want to have. Pickups SUVs are very popular in Australia. All your tradesmen use pickups for their business. They can load the tools in the back and then they use for a family vehicle on the weekend, normally double cab. So that's very popular here. I think there's a growing demand for importing the bigger pickup trucks. Uh, we're starting to see that in Australia. It's, there's definite segment there. You know, it's not huge volume. I just was recently talking to the Ram CEO about this, and uh, he said they have a, a company they use to convert the left-hand drive to the right-hand drive because you're a right-hand drive country. But yeah, um, so I mean, there's a lot of import going on with that, and he said there's a lot of demand. He says, you know, I remember talked to actually the Toyota chief engineer as well, and they are working hard to get the Hilux to be able to carry more capacity capacity because they have a lot more campers going out in the outback. And because they have that demand, that they're kind of against the wall because that platform can only do so much, but there is such a growing demand. You know, it's, it's like, why would you buy two vehicles when you can have a truck that serves as a family purpose and also as a worksite service? And that's what makes trucks and SUVs exciting is that the growth now in development with trucks and SUVs has been very much towards more utilitarian, but more comfortable. And, you know, we're finding creature comforts all over the place. I mean, I, I told a story once where I was with a Ram CEO and he was describing driving a truck at a uh, press conference and he got done. He did his whole song and dance. And I said to him, I said, I don't know if you're describing a Chanel handbag or a full size truck because he was talking about all the bling and the chrome and the materials and the leather behind and the snaps. And I was like, and he's, then he was talking about this, the suede headliner. Like, I'm sorry, I've been in trucks for years. I've never thought about cross shopping trucks based on the headliner material. It's never yeah. crossed my mind. <laughs> But I think our biggest challenge in Australia here is, is exactly what you said. There's not that many countries that are right and drive. To get enough volume, to actually justify doing that conversion to right and drive is very difficult. So we lose out on a lot of opportunities of being able to just have access to certain models and certain units. So it restricts our market, you know, unfortunately, quite a bit. Yeah, I, I've seen some photos of the conversion being done, and it's really extensive. And I can see why it's expensive, because it is quite the operation. If You know, if you guys you just go and just switch it'd be fine you know just make it happen you get the power right just john go tell them do it the other way i wish we could <laughs> but the market's the power so if the demand say people will do it it's all about business so if they can make margin out of it they'll do it what are the differences in terms of the pickup how do you see it involving in the future because you mentioned all the interior changes and that do you see it 
evolving further than that. We're going to see more and more electrification, whether it's through full EVs or a hybrid situation or a, uh, there's a lot of talk about hydrogen as well. We're going to see a lot more technology in, in vehicles, uh, especially trucks. You know, we're looking at uh, things where I can hop in the truck with my phone and my phone is the key. And now I just need to press the start button and go. And we're going to get to the point where we're going to do the same EV stuff like, like Tesla does, where if you just hop in the Tesla with your phone, you just start driving. There's no on button. You're putting your button to see that's the on button. Uh, we're seeing some innovative features. So like the, the Ram EV concept had an interesting feature. It was called shadow mode. And I, I didn't know what to make of it. And I was talking to some different ranchers about it. And so the idea here is, is if you were to buy yourself trying to get into a, like a horse corral, you could open the one gate, stand in front of your truck and basically summon your truck to you. And after it goes so far, walk behind it and close the gate. So you don't have to open a gate, hop in your truck, drive through, hop out of the truck, close the gate. Is it a game changer? To some, maybe. To some would say that, yeah, I got to have that feature. But I think that's what we're going to see more and more. You know, get more technology. Uh, they could get a lot more complex. I think what we're going to see is the internal combustion engine has never been more reliable than it is today. But we're going to see all these different add-ons to these vehicles. That's what's going to cause a lot of conversations online on reliability. It's, the engines are going to be fine. The V8s, V6s, whatever. I think V8 would maybe go away except for heavy duties because there's just not much use case once you start doing a hybrid system in the v6 or you do like a inline four like chevy's new 27 inline four is a really good engine and so i think we're gonna find engines that get smaller we're gonna find a lot more technology a lot more turbos a lot more batteries a lot more hybrid situation electrification i don't know that we're going to see much more luxury because we have already kind of met that luxury customers demands the price is going to keep going up i was just talking to general motors vp of operations and he's basically like we don't know if there's a ceiling for the price. We're going to keep raising the price until you all stop buying it. And then <laughs> there we are. You know, so I think we're going to see it's going to get more and more expensive, more complex, but it's going to have some features, I think, that are going to be game changers for some. Some won't ever use them, but they're just going to have more of that cool factor that people really are buying these days and other vehicles and other parts of their lives. You know, I mean, especially this next generation coming up is they don't tend to spend much money on furnishings and housing and stuff. They, they want their Xboxes and their computers and their technology, and they see technology as being being the end all be all. So it's an interesting shift. You know, we have this customer base that's uh, 55 to 70, 70 years old is buying the full size truck. They've always wanted a new full size truck. It's the only truck they've ever buy in life is a brand new full size truck. And then we have, I'm going to call them kids, but you know, it's basically my daughter's age, 20 to 20, 25, who are just buying what they want and they don't care about the price. They just want to get what they want. You know, for them, it's about how much is my payment for the 55 to 70 year old guy. It's like, how much is it actually? Because they have the cash to pay it outright. Funny things happen. I was on a, a Facebook group and some truck owners were actually bragging about how expensive their truck payment was. And I was like, wait, you're bragging? They're like, oh yeah, I'm like, I'm at $1,500 a month or $2,000 a month, whatever it is in, in Australian dollars. They were taking out shorter term loans. They were taking out 12 month loans on a $65,000 truck and paying it off in 12 months. <laughs> just, 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 yeah, just mind boggling. And it's interesting because you get like the customer base for, for trucks has changed so much. I still get guys who are like, I want a roll up window. I want a V8 without any turbos. I want no hybrid. I want no batteries. I want nothing in it. I just want to have a radio. And I want to have my engine and no sensors, nothing. I'll roll up windows all I want. And I said, I know where that truck is at. It's at the junkyard down the street. Go ahead and get one 1980s truck because that ship has sailed. These trucks these days are so much more complex, so much more going on. And are you seeing much in terms of diesel engines or is it all petrol? Yeah, actually, I own a diesel right now. I bought a, a Silverado diesel for this year. I buy a new vehicle every year for the, for the channel, for the business, and then I review a lot of vehicles. Diesel is a very interesting thing in the United States. It's had a bad reputation actually over the years. Uh, we had the Volkswagen really screwed up some of that stuff with their diesel gate cheating kind of scenario. We've had some 1970s and 80s diesels that were really pretty poor versions of it. And so we have automakers a little more cautious about diesels. Um, the, the Silverado I have and GMC has one as well in the Sierra are really solid diesels. But on the same token, we had Ford who had a diesel and half ton. They killed it. We had Ram who had a diesel and half ton. They killed it. And General Motors killed the, the midsize diesel in the Colorado and the, the Canyon here in the United States. Globally, I believe the Colorado still offered in that 2.8 liter diesel. But here in the United States, they, they killed it. Again, we have customer demand that's a little bit different on diesels. Uh, I don't think as a country really set up for diesel very well. A lot of fueling stations have diesel in like the back corner a lot with the semi trucks. And it creates some awkward times when you're filling up your little vehicle next to a big semi truck. And I just don't think that customers really like the next generation diesels with the emissions equipment that we put on these diesels have really 
caused a lot of concern about reliability and whether or not they're going to get to work well. And so really an interesting place where I think we're going to see in the future, we're going to we're going to be offering in the half ton segment or in the midsize segment, we're going to offer a hybrid only vehicle. That's it. And then in the heavy duty and really work truck kind of big segment, we'll have a diesel gas. I think that's where the industry is kind of heading to this point. I don't know if we're going to get there anytime soon, but that's it seems like that's all the energy heading in the two different directions. Because I heard there was some development on a diesel electric hybrid. You know, if you got into a remote area where you, you ran out of charge, you could actually use the diesel engine to charge your battery. So I, I don't know if there was much work done on that or where that's at at the moment. There is a lot of discussion about a diesel hybrid. We call it diesel hybrid, diesel, diesel electric you know, combination. They actually have them in Europe. Um, the Mercedes-Benz actually builds a car as a diesel hybrid combination. I was talking to a couple of engineers about this idea, and it comes down to a couple of issues. First of all, they're not really sure how to marry a diesel and a hybrid well, because a hybrid does really well when it first gets off the line. Torque curve is really high, and it does it does really amazing at that segment. Well, so does a diesel. With a tur- little turbo on a diesel, it does really well torque offline. So both a hybrid and a diesel provide the same offline torque ability. They both offer good fuel economy. And so you have this really interesting place where where where's one fit or the other? And then you have cost. So uh, in the United States, you know, if you do a heavy duty truck, a diesel over a gas is about ten thousand dollars more. And if you do that with a hybrid system, looking at additional five thousand on top of that. So you're looking at probably fifteen thousand dollars more for just the one vehicle because you have these two technologies. And then you also also have a problem with overall payload and towing. A diesel engine is actually pretty heavy, and the hybrid system is also really heavy as well. The lithium-ion batteries they have to put in, unless they do a really tiny one, are fairly heavy, and then you're running all this additional wiring and computer technology to run all this stuff. So you have expense, you have really heavy, you have limited payload and towing because you have all those weight, and then you have this really interesting discussion about whether or not which one works. Like if you're going to take, if you're going to towing, would you use the diesel aspect of the towing, or would you turn off and do the electric aspect? aspect, but how does that all work? And that's why I think when you look at the Mercedes-Benz sedans that they have in Europe, when I've looked at those, it seems like the price point of those has been a lot higher than a regular sedan. And I don't, I can't see sales results, but I would gather that nobody else has done it, which tells me that the market really demand isn't there yet. Because we interviewed some guys who were doing some work on fuel injection systems, and they were doing some interesting stuff around the increased efficiency in that. So in t- terms of a normal injector will have, you know, five or six holes. Uh, they've developed a nozzle, which has about a 150, 160 holes, and they've got a lot higher pressure in the injector. So what they do is get a lot finer particle, and it creates great efficiency. So you can do away with all the the other the add-on stuff to improve emissions so it looks like quite exciting stuff but uh, i know they were, they've done quite a bit of research and quite a bit of testing but they were looking to try and get it to that next stage the compression ratio is a really interesting topic so uh, chevrolet's moved to a full aluminum block for their little two seven liter uh, turbo and the reason for that was the aluminum technology has improved su- such a degree the aluminum blocks used to be a real big issue but now they've improved such a degree now you're having weight savings now you're gaining efficiencies and automakers are always striving to get more efficiencies for less parts, more reliable. It's it's interesting because they come with these systems where it's like, well, why do you do all these parts? You know, it's unreliable. And like, and they're like, hey, we're trying to get these parts out of here, but we have to have certain things to make the engine run. I'm a big fan of diesel. I think it can be even more efficient as we spend more time and energy on it. I just feel like, especially in the United States, the time and investment is not there for diesels. I am seeing some exciting research into renewable diesels that are not biodiesel. It's actually a secondary form. It's made out of soybeans. And we're seeing renewable diesel being shipped to cities in California. For those who don't know, California California has its own air resource board. It's called the California Air Resource Resource Board. And they have their own emissions levels that they try to meet. And so they're able to take this renewable diesel that they grow in a field, basically, and send it to a refinery. The refinery ships it to California. And that renewable diesel burns so cleanly and without any modifications. So you don't modify your truck at all. You just put it in there and you just fill it up. So when that happens, then you're able to have less emissions. It actually meets the overall emissions requirements in California. And if we get demand to be built up, we'll find a price point that's going to be more consistent. And, you know, with the renewable diesel aspect of it, you can do a price point that could be more consistent than you would in a refinery setting or an oil driving, drilling setting. We have a lot of demand in this country for diesels and, and fuels in the Northeast. A lot of homes up there heat their homes with diesel fuels in the winter times. So we have this back and forth of atmosphere with diesel pricing. And I'm always a bigger fan of let's have a more consistent price point because that way, from a business standpoint, you're able to budget better because you have your price point being better and renewable diesel being an option. Another thing that I think is really interesting and I 
I'm, I'm waiting to see more about is there's there's a hybrid diesel combination coming out that Toyota has been working on. I think I'm be working on because now you can take hydrogen fuel that you can basically you can fill up most abundant material in the atmosphere and it runs off no emissions. And then if you can make this combination work together, you could get even more torque at that lower end like you could with a diesel hybrid. You can have the electrifications built in. So you'd really drop the emission standpoint. There's always continuing development with that diesel technology and stuff from everybody's aspect. I just for me, I'm like, I'd love to I'd love to test out some renewable diesel and see if that's an option because currently the current movement towards full battery electric vehicles has not produced the vehicles that consumers have really wanted yet. Hydrogen to me is very interesting too because that has a lot of great aspects to it. But uh, my understanding is a big challenge is the storage and how do you transport it in storage. So I was in the port of Los Angeles with Toyota, who has developed a hydrogen fuel cell semi. And it was interesting watching those guys fuel it. So they have built the largest hydrogen fueling station because they, they have like six or seven bots. You can you can fill up a hydrogen fuel cell semi. Well, it, imagine the footprint you need for semis charging. So they have this huge station. And I was, I was asking questions about storage and things. And, I, and so they literally pointed across the park lot and there was a tanker sitting there, like the semi tanker aspect of it. Right. So the truck had dropped off the tanker sitting there and they said it's all that's all full of hydrogen. And what they do is they do a quick connect system like you would like a propane tank. They connect it up, they bring it in. And then the biggest thing is when they bring it to the vehicle, they have to make it cold because hydrogen expands as it heats. And so as it goes in a tank, it will expand because it's hot because you're doing a transfer. And so if they can't, they got to keep it cool. That way they get a tank faster. If they can keep that, if they get the hydrogen cool, you can store it in a big tanker and then you can apply it through having a, just a basic pump. And then you just got to keep that cool. And we're going to talk about how connects it's just a quick connect going in but this is the mother load this is what we're talking infrastructure this is a three compressor system we have liquid hydrogen over there it turns into a gas and the gas goes into the truck we're going to build the structure it can be like in gas stations and if we can build this then we're pretty much limitless on how far we're going to take this technology how far we're going to take this truck and so it's mind-blowing that this is all we have to do um, hydrogen is also created from natural gas. It's created from algae. It's created from solar, wind. I mean, it's created from a lot of different aspects of it. One of the challenges they've been having is how to make it more efficient to capture the hydrogen. So when you split those atoms, how do you get that hydrogen to be most of it, not wasting so much of it? And there's a the United States government actually has a uh, renewable resource aspect of it. It's in Boulder, Colorado, and they're actually doing some long-term testing on how to get hydrogen to be more efficient. But, you know, hydrogen's got the same difficulty in infrastructure that battery EVs have. You know, you have to have these charging stations or hydrogen fueling stations. You have to build the infrastructure. You have to create the demand. You got to create, I mean, there's just a lot involved in that stuff. But uh, one of the things I really like about hydrogen is I live around a bunch of farmers and there is a way that you can actually convert your leftovers from the cattle into hydrogen. And so I'm thinking from a farmer standpoint, you literally could create your own fuel on the farm and power your tractors, your trucks, everything you have off of the fuel you're creating on your farm. So you can actually be, you can literally be self-sufficient in some ways by having your own power source there. But I think in Australia here, I think everywhere they're starting to classify hydrogen into blue hydrogen or green hydrogen, depending on where it's sourced from. Tim, and from your perspective, where do you see the pickup market? Are there any brands that are doing some very exciting things in the market? And which are those brands? What are the top things they're doing? I get excited for Toyota because they're doing a lot of hydrogen research and they actually have every vehicle they had built, I think even globally, they have a hydrogen solution for it. They're just waiting for infrastructure to build up. Ford is doing some really interesting stuff with the battery electric lightning. And then I don't know if you saw it, we have a little uh, Maverick truck. It's a small little pickup. We used to call them like runabout pickups for the farm and such. So they're actually offering now, you could consider four different classes of trucks because you have a little compact truck, the little mid-sized Ranger, and you have the Ford and 50 full size and you have a heavy duty, super duty. So you're talking about a full range of options there that you can get. I really really a big fan of Ram and the TRX, which is their monster off-road truck. And they told me that's literally sold out for about three years. And a lot of the sheiks and Sutter are buying this thing because it's just a beast. It's so, so cool. And I just bought a Chevy. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, it's hard for me because I, I love all the brands and I love what they're doing. Chevy's doing some exciting stuff with hydrogen as well. They have a project here in the United States with the U.S. military. They're doing a combination hydrogen with the Colorado midsize truck, trying to build something for troops. Because the idea here is if you're on a military mission, you can go out and set up a hydrogen depot and fuel your vehicle from there and use solar and use uh, different ways to create your own hydrogen so you could be more self-sufficient on a long distance mission or something. So, um, we're at this point where we're going to see a, a, a growth in the market. We're going to see a lot more new consumers come
coming in. We're seeing a lot of these electric truck makers like Rivian coming out, new startups, and they're buying these battery electric vehicles. They've never had a truck before, and we're having customers who, who want these trucks. And so what I'm excited for is this consumer who's never bought a truck before is now buying their first battery electric truck. And I'm going to be really curious to see what their demands are going to be as we move forward and how automakers are going to meet their demands for the lifestyle. And in terms of autonomous vehicles, you've seen Tesla doing a lot of work in that space. I think there's some big tests being done in Phoenix, Arizona. Where do you see that? How quick do you think that will move? Because that will make a huge difference to the market if it comes in. So I've tested three systems now. I've not tested a Tesla system because they're a little bit proprietary in who they give the vehicles to. But I have been in the GM Super Cruise system. I've been in Ford's Blue Cruise system. And Toyota has a system called Teammate. I think they call them level two autonomy. Level three is basically you turn your back to the car and it drives you where we want to you know, go. So I, we're not quite there yet. But what's interesting about autonomous vehicles and the, the one challenge they're really having is weather. If you can't see the car can't see. It's basically what's happening. And so, you know, like in my area, I can use autonomous weather for like six, seven months of the year. And then we get the snows or we get, you know, rain, whatever. And it just doesn't work in those situations, which is going to be the real thing moving forward and how to deal with that. So like battery electric works really well in the Sun Belt, right? So if you have a sunny area, uh, battery electric actually works really well because, you know, you, you tend to have better weather and they and batteries work better weather. And same with the autonomous vehicles. In warmer climates where you don't have the rain, a windstorm, stuff like that, and you keep the vehicle cleaner, uh, you can reuse autonomous vehicles. I think it could be a game changer. For example, in Australia, I know you do your big long haul rigs where you do like two or three semis together and you go to the outback with these big trailers. There are situations there that actually would make sense, right? So if you're going to drive 12, 14, 16 hours, why not let the vehicle drive in those designated spots that make sense? And that's what the United States are doing. There's, there's certain highways that they're along for autonomous driving, and that's setting up different parameters for that safety wise. And so it does work. It's a really eerie feeling behind the wheel of a Thomas truck. I actually had my wife drive one, I don't know, about three or four months ago, and she was freaking out <laughs> because you're told to let go of the steering wheel. Well, and it's driving. And so they had this, what do you do? And so my criticism with it has been, frankly, it's this, it's that because level two autonomy requires a driver in a seat and uses cameras to look at your eyeballs, make sure you're paying attention to the road. And so I don't understand where the net benefit there is. I'm going to sit here, but I can't look at my phone or it's going to beep at me and tell me to look at the road. I can't like read a newspaper or anything because it's going to tell me to look at the road. So now I just sit there. I don't know what the real benefit here is. I I mean, I could see it like, again, if you were long haul driving and you want to take a little break, rest your body a little bit because you're not resting your eyeballs. And I find that I'm actually less relaxed in autonomous driving. I'm more stressed because what happens is if you go through like a corner and the truck can't make the corner or something, if the system doesn't work, it'll say, take the wheel, take the take 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 And all these alerts go up and you have to grab the wheel immediately. So you're kind of on edge looking for those scenarios where the truck wants you to take the wheel immediately or the car in whatever case you're driving. And so you constantly kind of prepped up to take the wheel, but then you can relax at times. If you know you're like, I live in the middle of nowhere here in Nebraska. If you're on a long straight road, which they're everywhere around here, um, I could kind of relax a little bit because I know it's a long straight road, but I could see like in a a downtown city situation where, you know, it's going to alert me to take the wheel. I have to pay attention to that, but then I can sit back and I, then what you can't look away then. So that's why I don't, I I don't quite think we're there yet. There's a lot of conversations about being building corridors for semi trucks to drive drive autonomously and drop things off. But I don't know. It, it, it seems great. We just, there's a lot of issues with LIDAR, a lot of issues at night, a lot of issues during windy conditions, snowy conditions, that kind of stuff. And it, really all that stuff leads people and leads me to think, and I kind of idiot for not doing this, is I want to just buy it and build a bunch of uh, car washes. Because here in the future, all we're going to be doing is washing our cars more often because we have so many sensors on these. The sensors can't see through the dirt, so we're going to have to have perfectly clean cars. So I think that's a huge business opportunity. But another thing which I heard is that they're very reliant on the, the lane markers. So if those aren't very clear on you, it has problems. Because I thought it was a more like a GPS location. But they said, no, it, it actually becomes very difficult in rural areas where the markings may be... Dirt road. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't realize that. I thought it would have a GPS tracker that could take it down the dirt road. Well, it, but GPS is only accurate to like within a couple of feet. Yeah. So then they use cameras built into the um, mirror, like the top of the windshield. And then those pick the lane lines. Then they use sonar. They actually have sonar below the logo 
the vehicle you know, on the front that sends out sonar. And then so they use then they use other cameras to read around you. And so that's how they work. I've, uh, there is a new technology called LIDAR, which is basically makes a, a 3D dimensional view of the, of the surroundings. And our U.S. military is working on that situation, trying to get that to marketplace. What they want to do is they want autonomous troop carriers. And so you put your troops in the back and then the vehicle drives to the spot and drops the troops off and turns around and go back. And that's all it does is does is Thomas troop carrying. And so you cut down the casualties because there's no driver in the vehicle, cut down on, on snipers taking out the driver, that kind of situation. And then you could actually cut payroll as far as you don't need that driver driving troops to the front and back. Or like imagine like a tanker, like trying to refill tanks or something. If you just type the coordinates where it needs to go, it could drive out the, that spot and drop it off for you. So there's a lot of research involved in that. Every military is the same idea where you want less people exposed to gunfire and to, you know, a mortality situation. And you want to be able to use more like drones or autonomous driving to get there and back. And so I think there's some really benefits there. There's a lot of research in the United States currently with uh, companies that do like minivans and things in that they want to be able to have an option for the elderly to get to say some autonomy to get to like a doctor appointment or to go to the store. And so instead of sending a van over to edit some a home or whatever, pick up 20 people, take them to the doctor, you could still have the ability to drive. You just, the car would drive for you. So you give you some level of freedom back in your life and some level of, I don't have to wait for a ride. I don't do that kind of stuff. I can just get a drive around. And so there's conversation about that for the blind, you know, the blind could get in the vehicle and do autonomous driving. So there's, there's some real world situations that autonomous driving actually makes sense for. There's just a lot of limits currently with technology the way it is. And also there's going to be a lot of, I think, legislation coming out trying to make those safety regulations and how does it make sense. Tesla right now is under extreme pressure in the United States about their full driving system. They actually had to recall every Tesla built because that system has been proven to be unsafe. Because yeah, I think that's a challenge. I don't think legislation is really caught up with it, especially from insurance perspective and legal aspects. Who's responsible if you have an accident? Is it Tesla? Is it the car? Is it the driver who is sitting behind the wheel? So I think there's a lot of to be sorted out in that area. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And trying to get people to understand it's is it fully autonomous? Is it level two, level one? You know, where, where's we're at? We've had so many stories of guys sitting in the back of their Teslas going down the highway in California playing with their cats or something. They get in an accident. Like, well, the car was driving me. And Tesla makes it very clear in all their documentation, everything. This is not full self-driving. But then they call it autopilot. So <laughs> it's, like, it's like, come on here, guys. Do you see any other major trends in the automotive industry? that are coming that could really impact the industry? There's a lot of changes happening. I think we're going to see a real growth in a compact truck. I think we're going to see a lot of real growth in the city dweller aspect of it. I think we're going to see sedan sales continue to diminish. You can take a little Ford Maverick, for example. It's crew cab. It's a four, four or five foot bed. You can get that in a hybrid system. In the US, it gets 30 miles per gallon. I think it's 30 or 40. So it gets a really exceptional fuel economy. It fits in parking spots. And then you have the utility aspect of having a bed. So if you want a potting store, you want gravel, whatever, you can throw it in the bed and it just opens people's lives up to doing a lot more. What I'm excited for is I think we're going to see a lot more trucks coming out that can fit a bigger, broader range of consumers. And I think we're going to see more and more consumers start going, you know what, why would I buy a little car, a little sand, whatever, or I get the truck that gives me all the same fuel economy benefits, but I can have more utility with that vehicle. We're going to see more electrification. Better EVs are not going away. It's going to keep growing. I'm hoping we're going to see hydrogen will be the next thing. We've had some conversations with Ram Heavy Duty. They're talking about doing Doing a hydrogen version of that. Toyota Tundra already has a hydrogen version. They're just waiting to launch it. Honda this year is coming out with a CRV hydrogen version in the United States. And so we'll have the first consumer vehicle from Honda. I was in Japan a couple of years ago and they are fully invested in hydrogen. So I think those trends of alternative powertrains with different sizes of vehicles are going to see a, a massive growth. And those two trends are going to kind of come together. And I think we're going to find a situation where we're going to have guys who are going to go lift their truck, put 35s on it and run diesel tanks off the back and blow diesel drive next to a car that's that's a little smaller Maverick that's running fully electric. I mean, it's just, it's going to be such a wide range of different customer needs. Your Australian market, like, yeah, how many youths do you see down there? Is that becoming a bigger part of your, of your overall makeup? No, the SUV is becoming very popular. So more than 50% of the market is SUV. So for the last 10 years, and that's increasing, I think it's mid 50s now, 55, 58%. Your youths are very popular, both in the rural areas for farmers, all in the outback and all your tradies use them for business because they've put their tools in the back 
and they have normally double cab that sort of unit. And there's a lot of incentives for even over COVID now, they had incentives where you could write off the vehicle, you bought it uh, for business, you could mm-hmm. write it off in that year up to, I think, mm-hmm. about $30,000. So not the full amount, but it's still a substantial amount. So a yeah. lot of guys went and pulled those sales forward. So I think last year to this year, the sales of, of those pickups have gone down a couple of thousand units. But it's not, it's just because I think they've pulled business forward in the last two, three years. I think that will come back. Uh, but the passenger market is definitely. It's just diminishing over time. So it's getting less and less. Are those SUVs, are they, are they smaller SUVs? They're sort of all medium SUV. The economy is tightening up at the moment. Interest rates have gone up. So there's a lot happening in, in the market from an economic perspective. So what's happening is people, they might have a, had a big SUV, are now hoping back to a smaller SUV. But people, even retired couples, people just entering the market with small kids, so they all jump into the SUV. They might buy a small SUV to start, and then they, when the family gets bigger, they get a couple of, you know, you get some sons who are six foot two. <laughs> <laughs> so they have to upgrade to the bigger SUV. You know, you have that type of thing happening. But I think it's going to continue to move in, in that direction. Because you've got the outdoors here, there's a lot of interest in 4x4 stuff and there's a lot of 4x4 clubs and camping, fishing, all those type of activities. And we've got so much space here. You know, Australia's just huge. And you've got all the outback. So people for holidays or long weekends, so people are all out hiking or camping or fishing. Or, you know, we've got extensive beaches. So there's a lot of outdoor activity. What about electrification? Are you seeing much better EV vehicles? Is that something you're watching? Is that coming to Australia? The challenge with Australia in terms of electric vehicles, there wasn't much demand for it because there wasn't any government support and incentives behind it. Okay. So there's no advantage to have it in an electric vehicle. But hmm. what's interesting now, they, they're now starting to bring some incentives in. We had a change of government in April. So okay. I think we're going to start seeing more electric vehicles. There wasn't much infrastructure and our distances are huge to drive from Melbourne to Sydney, right. you know, it's about nine hours drive. And from Sydney to Brisbane is another eight, nine hours drive. And from there to Cairns is 14 hours. So distances yep. here, are the same in the US, just huge. And if you don't have infrastructure charging points and being able to charge very quickly, if you have to wait an hour every time you want to charge your vehicle, it becomes quite difficult. The other difficult thing here is that talking about, I know in the state of Victoria where we live, they're talking about putting on an EV tax because they used to get a certain percentage of fuel is taxed by government for road upkeep. So they're saying, well, we're not getting the money because you're not putting fuel in your car, but we still need to tax you. So there's been, everybody's been up in arms about that saying, well, how, you know, how can you put a tax on an EV? You know, it's not right. So there's a lot of debate about that and where that goes, I don't know. Our market, new car market, is not that big because Australia's, we only got 25 million people here, but we did about 33,000 EVs last year. Hmm. Out of about a million and eighty thousand cars, still sitting at around the three percent. So very, very small. Uh, but it's increasing. All it's starting to increase. It's starting to become more acceptable. And I think as more infrastructure gets put in, as people get used to it, and people were concerned about the distances. And I know when the first EVs came out, you know they used to talk about one hundred and fifty kilometers as a distance. But in reality, you might be getting 80, 90 kilometers on the initial listen leaves. But now the cars are getting four hundred kilometers. Ninety nine percent of people don't drive that distance in a day. You might drive. Right. You know, maximum of 150 kilometers. I think it's people starting to understand and get accustomed to it. And once you start to know someone who's got one, and it works quite well. I think you'll start seeing more of them. I had the same thing. I had a GMC Hummer, the $110,000 big SUV over Thanksgiving here at the holiday in the United States and uh, took a bunch of cousins for a drive. And they're just like, oh, this is, I hate EVs. And they get inside and I took them for a drive and they're like, wait, that's it? That's all the hoopla is just this? I'm like, yeah. I mean, they were impressed by it, but you know, we have all these thoughts and the political aspect and all that kind of stuff. And, and you get somebody in the EV and especially like the Hummer, it's just, you know, it's an electric golf cart. It's, it's not like it's, it's just an alternative way to power a vehicle. And it's interesting you talk about the taxes. We have the same argument happening here. We have states and counties that are putting their own road. It's like a mileage tax for EVs. There's conversations about tracking. Do you track miles? Do you just charge them a flat rate? I mean, I don't know. It's very interesting. But that was good. I'm glad you shared that with me. It's interesting how the world is really big, but in reality, we're all facing a lot of similar issues. But I think the interesting thing about an EV is when you see the acceleration 
of an EV. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's, like, that's unbelievable. Yeah. And, and that makes, you know, people don't realize that. So it can still be an exciting car to drive, except you don't hear the engine noise. But if you put an engine, yeah. if you put some sort of app in your car, which you can do, you can yep. create the engine sound for yourself, you know, <laughs> to feel good. I saw a guy with a Tesla who put a Dodge Hellcat engine exhaust okay. note in his Tesla. And the Tesla apparently has got outside speakers. And so he's like, he's going around. It's fully electric. It doesn't make any noise. But yeah, it's interesting. EVs are also interesting for people that live in uh, colder climates in that there's no waiting for the radiator to heat up. And so you have cabins that are warmer faster. And you have just some, there's always a little things that, you know, the acceleration is fine, but, you know, it's also smooth and quiet and it's very well balanced because now you put the battery in the middle of vehicles the center of gravity is really good you don't worry about like big suvs where you have like you oversteer through a corner where you, you, the vehicle is kind of pushing it away out of the corner because you're trying to steer through the corner with an ev it's a very linear experience and so it's, it's a very interesting um i think people get too tied up in evs and what they do and what range all kind of stuff and they don't always see all these different benefits to them and i actually have two different evs in order because who knows what i'll get there's really no structure around me but the reality of the matter is i would do all my charging at home and at home charging like that hummer had like a equivalent of like a 40 gallon gas tank a massive tank just huge and it cost me maybe 10 bucks filled up with electricity and it's so much cheaper and it's like is it environmentally better no the, the hummer is not an environmental vehicle at all it's it's a toy we're still running stuff on coal here in the united states so it's not cleaner it's not all this kind of stuff but there are some really fun benefits to them that you just don't anticipate until you drive one but i was involved in setting up the first EV dealer network for Nissan when they first brought out the EV in Norway. And one of the big concerns we had is because it's so quiet, pedestrians don't hear the car coming. Mm-hmm. So there was a lot of debate in the company. How do we try and counteract that? And I don't think we ever found a solution for it. To Do you put a speaker as, as tester and put a, yep. a vehicle noise? to Because people are stepping out in front of the cars all the time. Yeah, pedestrian accidents are actually pretty massive. I remember doing some conversations. It's interesting to go back to Australia, uh, the uh, kangaroo bars. So in your outback, a lot of your trucks are having kangaroo bars, which are, if you don't know, and I'm sure your audience knows, but there's basically steel bars going in front of the vehicle because you have so many kangaroo accidents. There's basically four steel, steel bars that keep the kangaroo from damaging the vehicle. However, what they found, and when you take those same trucks to a city environment, is that you, they're literally killing pedestrians. <laughs> so that wasn't any good. Uh, England actually did this where they, they made, the statute say that the kangaroo bars or bull bars, whatever you call them, will actually wrap around the front of the hood better. So that way that your back of your head, if you get hit by one of those bars, can snap back and go against the hood and your likelihood of living through that are much greater than you would elsewhere. I want to say it's been four or five years ago, I was writing a story about it. Uh, your government was actually proposing banning uh, kangaroo bars and there was a big issue in the outback because the outback has needs for them, but those big trucks in the city environment were literally killing people. So it's a it's very interesting conversation. Pedestrian crash is going to be a huge topic moving forward, especially with EVs, especially with uh, designs of vehicles and vehicles, and especially trucks getting taller and wider and bigger. It's creating lots of conversations. So I come from South Africa originally, and South Africa is the same because you do so much bush driving. Mm-hmm. It's not always against animals, but it's just because you're driving through the bush and there's branches or there's right, uh, right. to brush it aside. Because if you don't have them, you just scratch your paint and yep, do yep. a it's- huge amount of damage. So the idea of it is to push the bush away or those branches, break off those branches so it doesn't damage the vehicle. You just see them everywhere. Very popular. Yeah. It used to be a big accessory fitment for us. We used to mm-hmm. sell thousands of them. A yeah, very it's, important it's part of the business. Big around me. And we actually call them bull bars because when the bull is not happy, the truck actually moves the bull because you're not moving a bull. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, uh, I talked to a rancher when I said, I said, do you actually tap your bull in the butt with the bull bar? He goes, uh, it's like a 2,000 pound animal. What else is it supposed to do? Because <laughs> it's just a little love tap and it moves along. <laughs> and I'm like, all right, hey, that's all on you. That's uh, That's impressive. Yeah, no, thanks very much. We really enjoyed talking to you. And just for any of the listeners, if you haven't uh, subscribed to Tim, you've got a fantastic channel and more than 90,000 subscribers. And I think you, you're heading for 100,000 at the moment. So if you haven't subscribed to Tim, I think jump on to Tim's channel and subscribe. And I really appreciate it. And I really appreciate the comments from Globally because I read a lot of the comments. I read as much as I can. And it's really interesting getting your perspective on what I'm covering and how you see that in your daily life and how I can make my job better. So it, it is, it's a lot of fun. Thanks very much for listening. We hope you enjoyed the show as much as I did. It was really great to get a good understanding of the American pickup market. Tim has such a great depth of knowledge and it was great to catch up with him. If you enjoyed what you heard, subscribe to our channel. We will talk to you again next week.